What up, guys? Bobo here with Brass Real Brothers. And thanks for coming back for some more popcorns. All right, real quick before we get started, if you haven't done so already, why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button and the like button. <laughs> well, we're finishing out the franchise of Scream with Scream 4, my third favorite. Yeah, that's right. This one's grown on me over the years. I didn't like it so much in the beginning, but over time, I like it more and more. And this time around, Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson are back together as the writer-director duo, with Kevin being absent on the last film. All right, so by this point, we all know that there's gotta be an opening scene for a Scream movie, an opening kill. How are they gonna make it any different from the last three? And they did a pretty good job, if you ask me. Some of my friends kinda thought it was silly and cheesy, but I loved it. Cause the whole idea of Scream is to make fun of itself and to be self-aware, and it definitely was. Doing little things exactly the same way they did in the first movie. Instead of talking about Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street and Jason and all that, they're talking about Saw in this one. Nightmare on Elm Street. Is that the one where the guy had knives for fingers? Yeah, Freddy Krueger. Well, I like Jigsaw. I think he kills people very creatively. At first you're thinking these girls are getting killed, but then you see that it's Stab 6. And it's like they're watching the movies, and then they go to some other girls watching them in the movies. Oh my god, I love it. I've seen it five times. It's just super over the top, but kind of cool. I really liked it. Especially since you got like Anna Paquin and Kristen Bell. But the problem is, is that at this point, it's no surprise on who's getting killed. Cotton was a surprise. I liked that in part three. But in this one, by the time they get to the actual girls who are the opening kill scene, who are watching the stab movies, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. I don't know. The first one, it just completely caught you off guard. The second one, it was just really well done. The third one, it was somewhat meaningful. And then this one, it's just kind of like, oh, another opening kill. But for me, I think the movie gets better after this. One of the things that everyone talks about in this movie, and I have to mention it too, is the filter of the camera or the lens that they were using. Whatever it is, it's got this weird, like, giallo look to it, where it really picks up the glare of lighting, like, hardcore. I like it to an extent. But some of the times it's a little too noticeable to where it's distracting. Like I see what they were going for with it, they just went a little overboard. But in some scenes it really works. Like any of the time that it's nighttime and they're outside and stuff like that, the camera looks amazing. It's just when there's a lot of lighting involved, natural or fake, it just sometimes looks a little too just distracting, kind of like it was in Jallo movies, like old school Italian horror. But it's now years down the road from part three and Sid is doing a book tour about her survival and how she's moving on from all these murders that have happened. Because remember, part one through three kind of took place in around this sort of bubble of time. Scream 4 was a long time later. Dewey and Gail are all married now. Dewey's the sheriff of Woodsboro. And the whole thing is, is it's the anniversary of the Woodsboro murders. So that's partly why Sid is back in town doing this book tour. And then people are putting up ghost face costumes everywhere, like on the lights and the lampposts and stuff. Oh, and they try to do that stupid Broken Arrow-esque music for Dewey again. God, I hate it. <laughs> All the other music I like, it's just when they do that, I don't like it. And while you have your core cast, Sid, Dewey, and Gale, you also have a new cast in here with a bunch of fresh actors for the time. Hayden Panettiere, Rory Culkin, Anthony Anderson, Adam Brody, Marley Shelton as the deputy to Dewey, since he's the sheriff now, and Emma Roberts as Sid's niece. So the only significance to the opening kills in the beginning are that those two girls went to this high school that all these new cast members are at. Roy Culkin plays Charlie and his buddy Robbie are sort of like the Randys of the group this time around. They're the movie nerds. Since it's 10 years down the road, now it's all sort of like web and internet based. So these guys carry around the web camera all day long and record shit. But since they play sort of the Randy role, they bring in all this new set of rules before the modern times. And one of the things they say in this movie that I think is kind of funny is they say, if you're gay, a horror movie you never get killed in fact the only surefire way to survive a modern horror movie you pretty much have to be gay which i've got to do some more research on that and see if that's true oh and one more character i got to bring in here is trevor emma roberts's boyfriend who's a total douchebag you know and this movie does just like all the other ones it pulls you left and right trying to make you think who's the killer and while I do like it, it's grown on me, I can't help but think, though, that, that Wes Craven was just doing this because fans were wanting another Scream movie. Because I think it turned out good enough, but I don't feel like it was a story that was just itching to be told. There are lots of callbacks in the films, especially this scene where Nev Campbell is up in this bedroom. And it reminds you straight up of the scene in part one where Billy Loomis is sneaking into her bedroom then. While Emma Roberts' character, Jill, her boyfriend Trevor, does the same thing. That douchebag. 
and they definitely make it a point for you as an audience member to realize they're like kind of paying homage to that what nothing you just uh you remind me of uh me Sid's book tour comes to a screeching halt because all of a sudden this evidence is planted in the back of her car so now Sid's of course is like oh sh this is happening again. Remember, I said this movie gets better after that first opening kill scene because man, this next kill scene you get to see is awesome. To me, I love this one and this sort of sets the tone for the kills and the rest of the movie if you ask me. But that kill where Kirby and Jill are looking across the street at their friend Olivia and the killer's doing this sort of three-way call with him. He's on the phone with one of them but the other one's on the phone with the girl across the street. Man, that whole thing, just the way it goes down, I think is brilliant. It's beautifully shot, and the kill is brutal, especially when Sid goes and sees the aftermath. <laughs> Something I like about this movie, better than part two especially, is that the killer isn't just running around all over the place in like broad daylight type scenes. The killer's really sneaky and in the shadows in this one. Even when Sid's running back in the house after Olivia got killed, the killer's still real sneaky. And I like that. I believe that more. So Gail ultimately teams up with the two Randy nerds because Dewey won't let her work on the case with him. She goes to the school and even brings Sid to one of their classrooms and tries to talk to all the students for a little bit to find out they're doing this party at this barn at the Stabathon Marathon watch party. Meanwhile, Sid's assistant that you hate from the beginning, you're just waiting for her to get killed, has a great kill in the parking garage. And I think it's because it looks like an old school Jallo film. In fact, the more and more that I think about it, this whole movie is kind of like a Giallo film. I wonder if that's what Wes Craven was trying to do with this, a sort of homage to Giallo. Because when Ghostface is running to her in the garage, it straight up feels like a Giallo film. And there's a lot of cool creepy background moments in this too, where you see certain shadows or movement in the background and it just works well. I think this movie has a little bit more of a darkness to it that's just better than the other films. I'm saying it's my third favorite, but man, I might have to switch that around. I gotta think about that in the next few days. So now multiple things are going on. You got Sid trying to console her niece while Gail's at this Stabathon watch party. First two movies, Dewey got stabbed and he's the one that really took the heat for everybody. Well, in this one, Gail gets it at this Stabathon party because she was trying to one-up the killer by putting cameras everywhere, but then the killer one-upped her. So right away, I like that, that they switched that up and just added a little bit more gravity to the situation. It would have been funny to have Dewey get stabbed again, but I'm just glad they switched it up. Meanwhile, sh** goes down over at Sid's aunt's house, which, by the way, great casting to play Maureen Prescott's sister. But I gotta tell you, I saw her kill coming a mile away. As soon as she went to that door and they were fighting the killer off, I saw that happening. So the kills in this are good at some points and they're just kind of in other points. But when they're good, for me, they're really good. It's kind of silly though when Anthony Anderson just gets stabbed right in the forehead. I mean, come on, can a knife really go through your head like that? But at this point, the Stabathon Marathon got broken up because of the ghost face attack. And now all the kids have migrated to Kirby's house. Just kind of like the end of part one, all these kids were at one of their parents' houses with no supervision, which is kind of one of the reasons, side note, I wasn't so impressed by the fifth one because I felt like Scream 4 was doing a lot of rehash stuff from part one to sort of have that familiar fun you like to have when a movie's made 10, 15 years later. Scream 5 just did the same thing I felt like that Scream 4 did. Maybe that's why I was slightly disappointed in Scream 5, but anyways, moving on. Robbie's outside having fun with his camera. He's all drunk, and I just love that scene when he turns around and Ghostface is right there. And that scene right there is pretty funny because he's getting killed, but they're inducing comedy into it as he's getting killed. He uses the whole like, but I'm gay. I, I'm gay. I'm gay. If it helps. On top of this movie being a little darker than the other ones, another thing I like about this one is, is that everything that's going on, all the chain of events that are happening at the end of this movie, makes sense. Especially upon rewatching it now, it's just like, oh, I'm putting together how this would make sense. Some movies you watch, you don't believe that, that somebody could just be right there and then be here all of a sudden. Like in Scream 2, there was a lot of that. But in this one, I was kind of calculating it, recalculating all of the things that were going on, and it made sense who was here, who was there. I just think all that works in this. We get a great rooftop chase scene between Ghostface and Sydney, which is pretty cool. Just makes for a good cinematic scene. Like I said, Ghostface is just the depiction of him is real dark. I love it. And the major difference I think this movie does that the other three movies didn't do is it kind of has two third acts. The first third act is when they're at this party at the end at Kirby's house and everything starts going down. You find out who the killers are and it's Charlie and Jill. 
they do a two killer thing again just like the first movie but Jill the niece the whole reason behind it, I kind of like it. She felt like this in the shadow relative that it was always about Sydney and her life and she just felt like she got no attention. Kind of like the third one a little bit with the long lost brother. Then Jill and Charlie basically just start acting like Billy and Stu from part one. They really do, like they're in the kitchen, they're trying to rehash stuff. They even pulled Trevor out, had him all tied up. And again, they make you hate him this entire movie. So when he gets killed, it's kind of gratifying. Especially when Emma Roberts shoots him right in the dick. Ah! Yeah! Every time I watch that, I just get I'm like, ah! But when I say they're acting like Billy and Stu, they even go so much as to start stabbing each other just like they did in part one. Except that Jill kills Charlie immediately. Turns out that it was Jill's plan to do this whole thing, set everybody up, get Sid killed because Sid gets stabbed in this too at this point, which has never happened prior. But then you have the whole setup scene from Jill. She tries to make it look like all these other things happen, blame it on Trevor. And she goes crazy bashing herself up and just bruising and battering herself. Man, it's badass. I love it. Some of my friends said they didn't buy that she could do this along with Rory Culkin this whole time, but I did. I like it, and I thought it was great when she did this scene, too. But I love Emma Roberts. I got a little soft spot for her. So all of that I'm loving. It's the second, third act that's a little weird. Emma Roberts beats herself up and then places herself right by Sydney to try to make it all poetic and everything. Dewey finds them all with the Deputy Judy and all that shit. But they take him to the hospital. Dewey's talking to Gail, mentioning that Jill survived, and Jill had stabbed herself in the shoulder. Gail had gotten stabbed in the sh shoulder earlier by Emma Roberts now we're finding out, and she had mentioned to Dewey that they had matching wounds. That gets back to Gail, basically they put two and two together and they're like, oh sh**. And there's this showdown in the hospital that's just kind of unrealistic, it just, I don't think it would happen. And it's just like, what do you think you're gonna do now at this point because Emma Roberts is attacking them? All these things happen though, where Dewey comes in there, then Gail comes in there, then Judy comes in there. It just starts to get a little funny. But I do like the head zap scene with Emma Roberts. Anytime a horror movie can do something like that and be a little creative with a kill, an ending kill especially, I love that. Clear. Clear. And then I love the line by Sydney when she says, you forgot the first rule of remakes, Jill. Don't f with the original. All in all, I have a lot of fun with this movie as a slasher, and I think it was a great installment in the Scream franchise. I like it a lot better than part two and part five, and I kind of think it's starting to maybe be even with part three for me. Are there some flaws in it? Of course there are, just like all the other ones, because like I said, none of them will ever be like the first one. But I do think that this one captured some new fun darkness that the other three didn't have. And it was Wes Craven's last movie, so with that, there's just kind of an automatic love for it, even with that Giallo-style camera. The Scream 4, I give a B-. minus. Well, that'll do it for this review, guys. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. Hit that like button if you enjoyed it. And keep your eyes out for me and my partner, Andrew Worley's short film we're working on, Late Court. We got a trailer here on the channel. Oh, and if you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button so you can help us make it to the top. And as always, if life gives you lemons, make some hot fresh popcorns. Uh, Texas Chainsaw, Dawn of the Dead, The Hills Have Eyes, Amityville Horror, uh, Last House on the Left, Friday the 13th, it's one of those, right?